So, you know, we, we all want a good deal on anything that we buy. And um, at the same time, we're sellers, so we're trying to maximize our profit and maximize our margins. And so I think that one of the, the questions that we always get asked is, well, why would I want to offer a business discount? Why would I want to sell a product at a discounted rate? Um, and, you know, ultimately, um, it's a decision to make, but it's such a big market that if you're not offering discounts um, to business buyers, you're not offering an offer to the market, you can't make the money. Welcome, fellow entrepreneurs, to the Amazon Sellers School Podcast, where we talk about Amazon and how you can use it to build an e commerce empire, a side hustle, and anything in between. And now, your host, Todd Welch. What's going on, everybody? Todd Welch here. This is another episode of Amazon Seller School. And today we've got Adrian Rich with us. He's the product manager over at SellerSnap, which is the repricer that I use in my business. And in my opinion, one of the better repricers out there for sure. He's been with them for four years and we're going to be diving into how you may be missing out on utilizing and taking advantage of Amazon's business pricing, the business buy box, which is completely separate than the normal buy box, quantity discounting and things like that. So stay tuned for that. But before we dive into that, uh, Adrian, tell us a little bit more about your background and how you got into Amazon repricing. Sure thing, Todd. So firstly, I guess, uh, thank you for having me on the show. I'm excited to, to be here and excited to um, delve deep into Amazon business because I think it's a part of e-commerce that a lot of very experienced sellers aren't so accustomed or familiar with. And so it's, it's I think, good to, you know, re-uncover our roots uh, through this new tech and this new industry. Um, like, you, like you said, yeah, I've been here with Sellers now for four years and uh, this is where I had my uh, sort of baptism of fire of e-commerce was through this this business. I traditionally have a tech background um, and when I joined Sellersnap, I focused on building um, uh, tools for the e-commerce space, specifically in repricing by understanding the needs of sellers and the, the problems that they're experiencing and then attempting to overcome those problems with technological solutions. Um, so I guess it doesn't really matter what industry you're in when it comes to product management. It's just about understanding customer problems and then finding uh, robust solutions to, 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 to those problems. Um, and, and that's essentially what I do here. Yeah, absolutely. And when it comes to Amazon, problems abound, that's for sure. That is 100%. You know, data to, uh, to anything, it's, it's constant. Yes, 100%. And you're over there in uh, Tel Aviv, Israel, correct? That's correct. And that's become like a major tech hub. There's a lot of uh, software that comes, seems to come out of there, tech and just a lot of business in general. Yeah, that's right. So it's uh, definitely a bit of a Silicon Valley uh, of sorts over here. Um, I mean, I'm obviously Australian initially, and, and uh, this is where my career is driven me at the moment. And um, so we're, you know, building um, a good technology over here and, you know, in an American business um, with, uh, with some development that goes on over here. Very nice. So why don't we just dive right into uh, what what is the business buy box, business repricing, and why should people care about it? Yeah, great, great question, question Todd. So I guess uh, the thing to keep in mind before you even go into what is business repricing and the business buy box is what is Amazon business, which essentially is just Amazon's play at um, offering bulk purchasing to businesses. So anyone that has a business credit card put into uh, Amazon will be eligible for an Amazon business account. And then what Amazon is attempting to do is compete with wholesalers directly who, who sell to everyone from, you know, construction to manufacturing to cleaning services, anyone that might need to order in quantity um, and at a discounted rate for ordering in quantity. And they're, they're, you know, trying to really attack this market. And it's been a huge growth industry, I think, um, during one of the earnings calls uh, earlier this year. Um, Andy JC, I think said, you know, that it was a $25 billion business now, Amazon business, Amazon B2B, and it's only growing, but people don't realize that you can offer different prices to consumers than you offer to business buyers. And that means that there is a different buy box for business as well as different buy boxes for all of the quantity discounts. So the quantity discounts to, to be a bit more specific on that is, 
uh, anytime you're offering a discounted rate for buying more than one unit. And, um, and uh, this is the part of, of, uh, uh, of the uh, industry that I think uh, people in Amazon are missing out on. Yeah, for sure. It's, I've been utilizing business repricing and quantity discounts for quite a while. But uh, one thing that I think is a huge tip for anybody that buys on Amazon, if you don't have your account set up as a business account and you're buying a lot of stuff on Amazon, you're, you're overpaying for so many different products. It's, it amazes me sometimes when I go to a listing and I'm looking at, let's say a 50 or $60 product and my business price is $10 cheaper, $15 cheaper sometimes, not always. A lot of times it's, you know, 50 cents, a dollar, $2 cheaper, but sometimes it can be really substantial. And, you know, the people listening to this are probably starting a business or have a business. So you should be able to get a business card. But even if you don't have a business, it's pretty easy to get a business credit card. If you do, if you sell anything, if you sold a game, a used game on eBay, you technically have a business and you could probably apply for a business card, enter that in the Amazon and just use that as a hack to get cheaper prices for stuff you buy. Yeah. So I think it's, it's, it's an interesting one because, you know, where, where, um, you know, sellers and sellers aligned. And so there is an element of, um, we're also users of Amazon. So we obviously want cheap deals. We all want a cheap deal. I bought a, um, a sous vide the other day, <laughs> sporadically, you know, those uh, tools that boil, um, mates really well to, to be able to see them. Um, so, you know, we, we all want a good deal on anything that we buy. And um, at the same time, we're sellers. So we're trying to maximize our profit and maximize our margins. And so I think that one of the, the questions that we always get asked is, well, why would I want to offer a business discount? Why would I want to sell a product at a discounted rate? Um, and, you know, ultimately, um, it's a decision to make, but it's such a big market that if you're not offering discounts, um, to business buyers, you're not offering an offer to the market, you can't make the money. And so there is definitely an opportunity cost between philosophy and profit. Um, and for wholesalers and bigger sellers out there, it's a zero sum game. They're trying to move inventory. They want to decrease their IPI scores. They want to get um, high performing goods back into fulfillment centers. And so, you know, you bring up a really good point. It is discounted rates, discounted products, but it's about getting more inventory through the door. Are, are you, Todd, are you, do you do Amazon business? As a seller? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, we, like I said in the beginning, we use SellerSnap, your guys' repricer. And so as soon as that, the ability to reprice the business buy box came into the software, we turned it on immediately. I mean, we were doing it some before that, but, you know, we've got like a thousand SKUs. So it's a little bit of a pain to go through and set all of them up individually and then manage them and reprice them. So we weren't doing it a lot before then, but since the repricer started doing it for us, we do it for all of our products. Yeah. And I think that's something we heard around for a long time was that there wasn't really a way to do business repricing. Um, and so people wanted to do it. You know, you want to move more inventory. Most people are willing to sacrifice some profit in, 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 um, in exchange for moving more inventory through the door. Um, and so when we released this tool, a lot of our bigger sellers um, and some of our smaller ones jumped right on and then sort of said, um, we're going we're gonna to enable this solution because it's worth it for us to get extra velocity and open ourselves up to this new emerging market in Amazon business. Yeah. And it's, you know, I don't know if we touched on it enough, but as people who sell on Amazon know, there's this thing called the buy box and there's not only one anymore. There's lots of different buy boxes, uh, not only business and non-business, but even the regular buy box is different depending on the location of your inventory and uh, the location of the customer looking at the page and all of that stuff. And so we're all competing for that normal buy box. And then the business buy box is a whole separate buy box that if I go to a product page with a business account, I see that buy box instead of the normal buy box. And so for me, 
the reason I turned it on is because it just, it gives me a leg up against anyone who does not have that turned on. Because let's say in the normal buy box, I'm at $40 and the person I'm competing is at $39, but I have my business price set at $38 and 50 cents or something like that. And a business person goes to that page, they're going to see me over the other person. And that other person, if they go to the page, they might not even know that I have a business price set up and that they should be competing with it if they don't have a business account themselves. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's, uh, it's becoming more and more um, uh, nuanced um, with all the different buy boxes. You know, even last year, Amazon was doing a big push uh, for that program called Bopus, um, buy online, pick up in store. Um, not a great uh, acronym, but uh, it's it was even you know if you, they, they referred to that um, as hyper localized buy boxes. You know, you're you know somewhere in in the city in New York, and there's a Best Buys there that's got pickup. You know, you're only going to see that buy box if you're inside Manhattan, as an example. And so you do see that for for hyper localized goods. Um, you you know Prime users. Um, and non-prime users, they get different buy boxes. And yeah, like you said, business buyers and non-business buyers get different buy boxes. And it's exactly right. You don't even know that you might be competing against a business offer. And when the customer arrives, they're going to see the best offer. And that might be a business price in the business buy box. For sure. Yeah. So you, in my mind, it's a, it's a no-brainer to turn it on, especially for resellers, because you know if you don't have it turned on, you're not competing there at all. If you do have it turned on, you may have a leg up over everyone else who's reselling on the the same listing if they're not doing the same. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And and I think also, um, you know, one of the reasons it took so long for the industry to, to create solutions for the business buy box is because of how limiting the data was. So you know, I don't know if you remember back in the days, setting trying to set business business. Um, business prices when there wasn't any automation, you didn't know what to set the prices at, you know, for the quantity discounts, which we haven't even touched on yet. But, you know, maybe you wanted to offer 10 units of uh, cleaning products uh, for 10% off. You know, if you buy 10 units, get 10% off or, you know, something like that. But you didn't know what everyone else was offering. Someone may have been offering, you know, 10% off for five units or 10% off for 20 units. And so you were just making this outlandish decision about what you thought was a really good discounted rate, which for the private label space makes a lot of sense because you're sort of looking at supplementary products and similar sales ranks. And you just say, you know what, this seems like a good value option. Same as walking into a 7-Eleven and they've got buy one Kit Kat for one, you know, one price and get the second one for 10% off, you know, or half price. So it's not part of that situation. But in the wholesale and, and, and uh, arbitrage type space, it's a bit different and you couldn't compare those business offers. And so Amazon last year released all this data, which made it possible for, for developers to start building out tools to actively compete automatically using algorithms uh, for the best best prices. And, and this indus- part of the industry is still in infancy. So, you know, we, we sometimes see people turn on the business through pricing and uh, they've got no competition whatsoever. And so you're winning 100% of the buy box on the business side because the competition just doesn't exist. Yeah. And what what better situation is that if you're selling on a listing that maybe has three or four other people, they don't have the business repricing turn on, you do, or the business buy box, I should say, the business pricing. And yeah, you're just automatically getting every single one of those customers that comes on that is logged into a business account, which is a, a pretty large amount. Do you do you know the the percentage of people that are shopping with a business account off the top of your head? I actually don't, but it would be interesting to to run some numbers because I could probably do some research with our, our data team and ask them to bring up a report of what percentage of the orders are going through um, on Amazon Business. And, and B2C still predominantly is... Um, you know, the major channel, but where we see a lot of growth is in B2C, people buy things in single units and the average quantity size on B2B is much higher. And so especially, you know, if you're an FBM seller and you can get someone to buy two items, a small item, you're putting two in a box, that's a really good deal for you. And 
I think one of the challenges the industry still faces, and I think Amazon is probably working on it behind closed doors, but you know, you're an a FBM seller and you're offering a quantity discount for two units or five units or 10 units. But at the moment, you're still paying an identical per unit fulfillment fee, FBA fee, big impact fee for selling five units. And so the FBM seller can put two in a box, but you're still getting charged $3.40 each unit for selling five. And I think that for the, the industry to become really robust and for people to really jump on board, Amazon needs to provide some type of concession to make um, it, a, it more uh, uh, valuable or of, of interest to sellers to actually offer discounts. It definitely should be that if someone takes advantage of that quantity discount, you're only paying the fee one time. Yeah, or, or it doesn't have to be, you know, only one fee, but give some type of um, concession. You know, if I'm offering 10% off for the second item, then you offer 10% off the FBA fee for the second item, you know, something like that. But if I'm just lowering price to sell 10 items, but I'm not getting any concession, I think that's pretty stiff to sellers. Not that Amazon's in the interest of cutting fees, um, but I think that it's an economic lever and they can drive people into Amazon business, which I think is what they want to do. They want more people offering. They want to be um, the leader in business speed of e sales. And I think that that's something that they should do. And if, you know, anyone on Amazon is listening to the podcast, um, here's the advice, you know. Yeah, I think it just makes sense even regardless if Amazon's not giving any kind of break. I mean, if someone is willing to buy two, three, five, ten units and giving them the incentive to do that versus not, you know, that can, uh, it only makes sense to, to do that, to try to get them to purchase all of it because otherwise they might just land there and be like, well, I'd like three of these, but I might as well just get one and I'll come back later and buy the other ones closer to the time that I need it. Mm -hmm. And then maybe they come back and maybe they don't, maybe they go to a competitor versus if they, they wanted to get four of them. And then they're like, oh, I can get a 10% discount if I buy all four right now. I might as well just buy all four instead of waiting till later. They might, you might push them to do that rather than hoping they come back later. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think from, from the consumer side, it's very obvious, you know, buy more at, if it's discounted. It's a good deal, it's a good deal. And they're coming to my door. I can put those extra packs of toilet paper in the cupboard for next time I use, I'll buy three packs. But the, the, the part that yeah, I think is challenging is that the, the push from Amazon just doesn't exist yet in that if I sell those three packets of toilet paper at a discounted rate, I'm going to really hurt my bottom line with the fees. And so I think that, 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 that Amazon wants everyone in Amazon business, but they're not doing the justice to the sellers at the moment. And hopefully they come around and, and make that change. And, and then I think we'll see some really big growth onto Amazon business. Um, and that, I think that'll come in, in the next little bit. Yeah, an, an example that I just thought of is, uh, so we've got uh, an eight month old baby, so we're buying baby formula. Mm -hmm. Previously, a couple couple purchases ago, I bought like a four pack, um, but then I realized that, well, the four pack is the, the same price as me just buying one. So I'll just buy a couple, one or two, uh, every time I need it, because it, it, the delivery is like same or next day for these these baby formulas. And odds are I'm probably going to keep buying it, but eventually I'm going to stop or maybe switch to something else. And maybe I end up not buying as many as they could have gotten me to buy if they would have given me some kind of quantity discount, even if it was, you know, just a few dollars might've been enough incentive to just buy the four instead of the one at a time, you know? Yeah, for sure. Even just seeing sometimes the strike through price. You know, I think the strike through price is a good way to get someone to buy, you know, buy a few and get a discounted rate. Um, but it, it, the initial thing that I think of there is subscribe and save, um, which, you know, I think is having some big growth. Um, you know, we don't, we don't currently have a solution for subscribe and save because there's not significant APIs available for it. But I know that, you know, usually after Amazon has success with something, the, the API follows and that's when we can build solutions for it. Um, was there a subscribe and save offer with the, with the baby formula? Uh, no, no, there was not. Yeah, it's interesting. No subscribe and save, no quantity discounts, no, no nothing on any of that. Yeah, I think all, I think, I guess this is all a bunch of different um, mechanisms, you know, Amazon's trying at the moment. Amazon business is clearly very big. Subscribe and save is in growth mode and um, coupons 
uh, looks like it's exploding as well. And I think that they're all just these new mechanisms they're using to try to get sellers to, to well, just they're trying to lower prices at the end of the day. Um, they're trying to hurt sellers bottom line, but they are mechanisms that I think consumers really engage with, especially the coupons. You know, it's something we're all very familiar with using. You know, I remember growing up like clipping, um, uh, not even just coupons from, from supermarket magazines. They used to get dropped in our mailbox and this was a deal two for one, um, two, six packs of beer for this or that. And so you just used to remember them. Now everything's online. It doesn't matter so much. And it's, it's kind of fun because you, you have to go through the exercise of, of clipping the coupon and actually mm-hmm. kind of check out. And it's, um, uh, kind of nostalgic. And I think that customers really enjoy it. And all of this sort of ties back into to the bigger picture of, you know, business, Amazon business and, uh, Strap and say, trying to get more more quantities through the door. Yeah, for sure. It's a uh, it's psychology, essentially. When it really comes down to it, giving the the uh, appearance that you're getting a really good deal, or you know, you're saving money where you wouldn't have saved money otherwise, and just by clipping that coupon, you know, even if it's a dollar or two, psychologically the customer saying, yes, I'm going to buy this product. And so it increases the likelihood that they do complete that checkout, I think. Yeah, I I actually, I did, I did this the the first time the other day myself and I did enjoy the experience. And, you know, the fact that you don't see the coupon until checkouts, like it says what the coupon is, you know, 15% off from, you know, the green, green badge, but you don't see it on the price until you check out. So I was just like, I sort of wondered, I like, made my way down the steps to the checkout just for that experience. So I think that, um, you know, sellers out there should to engage in this exercise. You know, it's worth trialing some coupons and seeing if uh, it's worth it because it does gamify the experience for the buyer. And, you know, those types of uh, differentiations are hard to come by in the Amazon space because it's so ubiquitous. Everything is there and everyone's selling everything. So how do you cut through the noise and make your offer look more premium than someone else's? Um, offer a coupon. You know, raise the price, offer a coupon, and then you know beat your competition. So I think there's some some good opportunity there. Yeah, and it it gives you that little green badge. Yeah, search page, which can definitely help to stand out if not everybody else is doing it as well. Um, but if you're one of the few ones that are doing it, it can help pop your listing and be a little bit of a stopper when people are scrolling through. Yeah, definitely. Do do, do you um do you have a, a do you do it? Do you have a strategy with with coupons? You've been talking to some customers about it recently. I do some, yes. Um, not as strategically as I probably should and consistent as I probably should, but we do play with it. Uh, especially if we see like a dip in sales on a product or something like that, we'll throw up a coupon and see if that helps get the the sales to go back up, which sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. It depends on the product and the price point of the product and things like that. But um, it definitely helps with a click-through rate Mm -hmm. and it can help with conversion for sure. Right. Is that on the private label side that you're seeing that that click-through rate? We are... um, we have access to their brand registry and stuff because it's brands that we partner with. And so we get access to their seller central account, brand registry and everything we're selling on our account, but we have full access to, to all the various marketing tools and things like that. Right. Okay. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, I actually, you know, you know, Scott Needham, he's the, the smart scout um, owner. And I saw a post the other day that he made, he was very active on Twitter and he, he saw, someone put a coupon for like $700 on a product. So clearly they've just raised the price of something. I think it was like a lawnmower. You know, it was a high value ticket item. But if you're, you're strolling through, strolling, you're, you're browsing through Amazon for a product like that and there's all this other competition and you see this product that, you know, might, must feel very high value to have such a high cost, but there's a discounted rate. You know, I think that's a really good feeling. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity here. I don't know sort of how Amazon's hand, handling the legalities behind that experience because, you know, it is, it's at least, I know this from Australia, but it's illegal to raise the price of something and then call it a discount. And some of the supermarkets, we have a, a monopoly in Australia of supermarkets, uh, Coles and Woolworths are the two major players. And they're in a lot of trouble at the moment because they were raising the prices of goods and then putting 
uh, discounts on the labels saying everyday low prices. And they're in a lot of trouble with the ACCC, which is equivalent to the FTC in America. And I, I don't know how Amazon's dealing, dealing with that and how it plays back into a $700 coupon, but um, interesting nonetheless. Yeah, I, I don't for sure know the law in the United States, but I'm pretty sure we have something similar where, you know, because you're essentially manipulating people at that point. If you're normally selling a product for a hundred bucks and then you jack it up to five hundred dollars and put a four hundred dollar coupon on it, you know, that's you're you're manip doing some manipulation there and not actually giving people a discount. So I don't know for sure, but I'm, I think there's something uh, around that in the United States and that Amazon has been kind of cracking down on that lately too, right? They won't let you raise the price of your product and then run a lightning deal. They'll remember the former price and be like, no, that's cheating. You can't do that. You need to, it needs to be the lowest price that you've had in like the last 60 or 90 days. I forget exactly what it is. I actually didn't didn't know that with Yeah, I didn't know that with lightning lightning deals, but I do know that, you know, they offer these reference prices now. So list price has become a mandatory field on creating listings, and you see it on nearly all Amazon product pages. And then they also offer so there's the 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 four reference prices, there's the CPT competitive price threshold which is the price of uh, uh, on another reputable marketplace of Walmart or Best Buy's. And then you have the MSRP price, the average 14 day sale price. And there's a, there's a fourth one. And so now they offer this information through their API. And essentially what they're saying is they wanna, if you reprice, if you price too much above these values, they're going to deactivate your listing for potential high pricing errors and price gouging. And um, so I guess that, you know, it's all, all playing into the same sort of game of keep your prices low, keep them reasonable, or we will, um, we will, uh, make your, your offer. Yeah. Or the case that the, the government is making, uh, keep your prices high or else we're going to suppress your listing on Amazon, which, which is essentially what the, the government here is arguing because they've got a lawsuit right now against Amazon for, um, uh, essentially price fixing and price gouging because uh, what they're saying, and, and it's definitely true, is that because Amazon has that competitive price threshold where they'll suppress the buy box of your listing if you go above it, they're forcing people to increase their prices off of Amazon because Amazon's fees are the highest of just about any platform. So if you're selling it for $20 on Amazon and somewhere else for 15, Amazon suppresses you, you don't lower your price on Amazon because you can't. You increase your prices on Walmart, Shopify, and every other place. And so they're actually getting on Amazon for that. And I'm hoping that will actually go through because I think suppressing of the buy box and things is price fixing because price fixing is not price fixing to keep prices high. It's also colluding to keep prices low. It doesn't matter which direction you go. Of course, everybody just gets mad at the prices high. Um, but both things, if you're colluding to keep prices at a certain level, then uh, that is. Yeah, I think I think that one. You know, it's it's um it's just more anti-competitive. And I think that Amazon would argue, well, we're keeping our prices low, but they own so much of the marketplace that they can force the people that actually sell in the marketplaces to raise prices elsewhere. And so that is just naturally, I think, anti-competitive behavior. And as a consumer, not something that you sort of want. Uh, not that I'm you know, an expert on um, price, price fixing and, and, uh, and price law. Um, but, I, you know, I did, I did actually look, you know, I was talking with a customer the other day and looking at some of their data. And, you know, I saw that they had, you know, a, a high volume product. It was a, sort of a viral product. Um, we'll go into exactly what it was, but a viral product and the buy box was suppressed and they were, you know, 25% above, um, the list price and the reference prices. And we could see that, you know, they were getting, um, a lot of traffic through sort of the sales and traffic report. Um, and I think your instinct would be in that situation, we should lower the price to get, uh, the buy box, but in actuality, it was such a high viral product. 
and Amazon is the marketplace that everyone goes to, that people were just buying it and buying it and buying it. So that, you know, the velocity of selling hundreds of units a week, it's a $40 item, hundreds of units a week. And, you know, 25% above where the buy box would have been unsuppressed. And so that starts to get into the argument of, well, at high velocity items, do you want to have an unsuppressed buy box or do you want to be priced high for someone to click that button that says other buying options because you can actually be more profitable without the buy box. You know, most sales do go through the buy box, but there is an interesting argument there to say, well, what's the point? Yeah, I mean, if it's not possible, uh, sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes it is. Uh, the example I like to give is we we sell this little bottle of soap, right? And on Amazon, to make any kind of money, even to have a profit of like 50 cents, 75 cents, you've got to sell it at about $7, $8, somewhere in that range. But uh, Bass Pro Shops had started selling this for $2.99 on their website, basically the same price they were selling it in the store. So that it was like a lost leader essentially for them. And so Amazon suppressed the buy box of that. And if we sold it at two ninety nine, where they wanted us to sell it, we'd be losing like a dollar fifty on every one that we sold, just off of our cost, pretty much. And once you take out the Amazon fees, when we showed that breakdown to Amazon, you know they don't care about it at all. They just want you to sell at that price. But that's an example that because of Amazon, because of the fees that they have built in, it's impossible to sell it at that price unless you want to lose money doing it yeah it makes it it makes it really difficult um and then you know that's before you get into uh, the low inventory level fees and um you know uh, uh peak peak fulfillment and, and everything else but you know how can you you know the fulfillment on that product must have been more than two dollars you know i'm sure it was and um what do you what do you meant to do with that so i think it's a bit unfair um you know it'd be interesting to see what this you know, the court case you mentioned, how that pans out, because it is the suppression is a it is a challenge, and I, I think it is um, not conducive to to good behaviors from sellers on the marketplace anyway. Yep, yeah, I totally get what Amazon's trying to do with it, and we we, sh we need to get back to the business repricing. But I totally I totally get what Amazon's trying to do with it, but the implementation of it is extremely flawed. So. Hopefully we'll see some movement in that, but we'll we'll keep an eye on it. Uh, but back to the business repricing, we talked a little bit about resellers using it. And I think it's kind of a uh, uh, common sense thing that they should be doing, at least even if you're only decreasing the, the business buy box by like a penny or five cents or something like that. It's worth doing if you're competing against other people. Uh, but what do you see as the main benefits for private label sellers who on their own listing are not competing with anyone? But of course, you're you're always competing with the other people who are selling the similar products. Yeah. So I, I guess it would, from the private label perspective, I guess, um, you know, this just comes back to how you differentiate your offer from other products in the market. Um, and so, you know, while you don't need to have a solution that automatically determines um, pricing discounts based on your competition to make sure you, that you're the best value offer. There is some rationale to say, like you know, you with the um, the uh, um, sorry, what was it? The the um, formula. Sorry, the formula. No, baby formula. You know, w you know that you would have bought three units or five units if there was discounted rates because you know you're going to need this thing for three to six months. And, um, but you didn't because, you know, it's going to arrive in 24 hours with your prime membership. And so I think from a private label perspective, the incentive is there. You should be offering discounts to outmatch your competition. And, um, we, you know, with that, it doesn't have to be as dynamic. You don't need something that's getting in there and adjusting all the time to compete because, you know, your prices adjust much, uh, much more conservatively, much slower in the private label space, but just offering some rates so that when someone comes to the door, you know, you might not be selling 10 units at a time, but if someone does land on your product page, do you, you know, definitely better to say, but if you buy two, we'll offer you some discounts. You know, it can be a few cents just to trigger that emotion of, well, I may as well save some money. And I think that there is some, some really good incentives from a private label perspective to offer those business discounts and those unit discounts, quantity discounts. 
Yeah, yeah, I would say so as well. Just the just getting someone to buy more quantity in one stop is incentive enough uh, because otherwise, yeah, they might come back for your product, but they also might see that ad from one of your competitors and click over to them instead. So, you know, increase that lifetime value right on the spot if you can, for sure. I'm curious though with the repricer, um, and I don't know that this is a feature at all because I haven't looked, but is it possible with the business repricer to compete against other ASINs? With the business, it's a good question. Actually, it's not. So we, we have a tool we call follow multiple related ASIN, and it lets you uh, include a basket of goods or ASINs and then say how you want to behave. So you might say, out of all of these ASINs, I want to compete against the one with the best sales rank and price better than them, or maybe I want to compete um uh, against uh, or any of the FBA offers by the best price, whatever it might be. And um, so we, we offer that toolkit for B2C. At the moment, we don't offer it from B2C, for B2B. Um, and it would be interesting to, to see the feasibility on that. It can be challenging because obtaining that information is, um, it can be slow and, and, and uh, time consuming even for our algorithm because Amazon limits how regularly you can request this type of information. Um, but there's definitely a utility there. Yeah, I'm just thinking in the cases like if I I know who my main competitor is and that's who I'm fighting with, if I just say, hey, watch this ASIN and match their business buy box and their quantity discounts just to make sure I don't, I'm not losing out in that area. It may or may not be beneficial. I'm not sure, but it just uh, popped in my mind as something that might be cool. I think it's a really good idea. You know, I, I think we've all spent time shopping around Amazon. You know, I go, you go there all the time. You don't know what product you're going to look at. You know, I wanted to buy a little handheld um, bike pump the other day. Um, and I've also recently looked at uh, like a small glove box size um, jump starter cable. So the battery pack, you know, you used to have these big cables you had to have in your boot. You know, I didn't know which of those products I was going to go and buy. I haven't purchased any of them yet. Um, and maybe that's not a type of product that you buy in bulk, but you know, for, for $30, even with an air pump, maybe I would buy two of them and give one to a friend if you're offering that discounted rate and, and you have to compete against, you know, there's 50 or a hundred of these things coming out of China. So how do you show differentiation? And I think that if there's a lot of these different offers all priced similarly, and one of them's got a business price and I have a business credit card, I would certainly choose the, the best price product. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think that is an important point in and of itself. If you're searching for an air pump and you're on that search screen and I have a business price on mine and nobody else does, it's going to show, like you said, that little strike through and the lower business price. So that may be enough to get me to notice the listing and, and click on it instead of clicking on someone else's. Yeah, that's right. I think I think they were doing a blue badge for a while. I think it says um, this is a preferred business price, and it shows in the search page as well when there is one, as well as in the offers on the right hand side. It sort of says um, this is a business, a specific business price as well. So there is some push there um, if you're offering those business prices and you know beating them by a few percent. Um, and so I think that uh, yeah, definitely definitely worth it. It's on the private label side. Well, we've mentioned about the follow uh, the buy box. And so now we're getting into a little more just the seller snap repricer itself. Um, but this is one thing that I think makes it so cool is uh, what I do with the follow the buy box. I, I don't necessarily care about following, you know, other competitors and stuff like that, but I will take products and I'll create, you know, a two pack, three pack, six pack, something like that. And then I'll use the follow buy box to make sure that my two pack isn't like outpricing the single, you know, so I'll use it in that way. So the two pack will follow the one pack and then the four pack will follow the two pack and the six pack will follow the two pack, a, a multiple of it. And so I use that to keep my prices in line. That's really interesting. You know, I haven't actually heard that utility before. Do you have competition on all the pack sizes? Not usually on the packs. Uh, sometimes over time, people will start jumping on them. And so what I'll do 
is uh, because again, this is another thing that's so cool. I can set up if then statements, right? So I'll say follow this ASIN unless there's a, another FBA seller or an FBM seller, then switch to the AI repricer and compete with them there. I, w- I just wish there was a way that I could switch to the AI repricer and say, but don't go above whatever the multiple of this one. Yeah, interesting. That's awesome. Actually, I really like that. That's, um, yeah, you heard it here first. <laughs> There's uh, the technology and the strategy, whoever's listening. That's a, that's a really interesting one. I, um, I'm going to uh, look into that a little bit because I think there's some utility there. You know, we could sell a snap. We're not, we're not there at the moment, but who's to say that we don't just create the listings for two packs, three packs, four packs and have them follow. And then, you know, um, there's a lot that can be done there. It's, that's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely something you could do with the virtual buy boxes, at least. Um, the problem with the virtual buy boxes is then you're paying the double fees again, where if you cr- actually create the bundle yourself, you only got the one fee. But it still would actually kind of be a, a cool feature to test with. You know, be like, virtually create me these different bundles and reprice them for me. Let's see what happens. And if one of them takes off, then yeah. Yeah, interesting. It is an interesting one. There's uh, definitely a lot to, to test and play around with those types of things. And it just sort of reminds me, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. I know you have as well, but people are so creative. It's like, it's constant. Everyone's coming up with something, the next, uh, the equivalent of the next get rich scheme, but they're just strategies these days. And, and it's, uh, it's great to see the creativity. Yeah. I mean, that's why you always got to be learning because the, the, I think one of the biggest things to always remember is that you don't know what you don't know. For sure. It might sound weird, but I'll I'll listen to my own podcast because there's always something that I pick up and be like, oh, I forgot that we talked about that, or I missed that when Adrian said that. That's a really good idea because I'm here trying to continue a conversation and keep us going, keep us on track. So I I there's a lot of times when I re-listen to my own podcast um, that I think of something that I need to try out. And of course I'm listening to lots of other podcasts and YouTube videos and stuff like that. But that's why you always got to be learning new things because you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And then, you know, I think also to, to complement that is just deciding on one of the things that you learn and sticking to it. You know, I know that sometimes I watch a video and there's 10 different points and I want to implement all of them, but because there's 10 things, I can't do them all at once. So I implement nothing. And sometimes you just have to say this one thing can be instrumental. I'm going to stick to it. I'm going to implement it. And then I'm going to watch the growth and then I'm going to come back, but just focus on one learning at a time. Yeah. hundred percent. Anything you do, whether, whether you're listening to a educational podcast like this one, watching a video on YouTube, going to a conference, whatever the case may be, you're going to probably come away with a ton of things. Like in this one episode alone, there's probably five to 10 action points that someone could take. But in reality, you're never going to probably do all of them at the same time. So just pick one thing, be like, I'm going to go turn on business pricing and set it to be 1% cheaper or whatever than the regular buy box. And if that's all you do, that's going to help you incrementally. And if you do that over and over and over again, they start piling on top of each other and exponentially helping you. Yeah, that's exactly right. They, um, you know, uh, habits, habit stacking. Um, I don't know if you've ever read Atomic, Atom, Atomic Habits, but, you know, you make a bunch of good habits, they stack and it becomes exponential and your bad habits do the exact same thing. And I think that's um, for improvements and, and things you learn as well. Yep. hundred percent. So many people get stuck because they feel like there's so much to do. And they never get started and take that first step because they're focused on the 20th step. And they're like, I don't know how to do that. I got to figure out how to run advanced PPC strategies, but I haven't started selling a product yet. Just get to a Walmart and find a cheap product and list it. You know, something in pets, pet supplies, something on gated. Just do it. Just choose a product and just go. And and you're right. People get stuck thinking way too far down the line. Yep, exactly right. Uh, So... One thing I want to ask you before we wrap up here is, you know, there's been a lot of negative publicity lately around selling on Amazon. And uh, Scott Needham actually just released a graph that shows the the steady decline 
of people signing up for softwares like Helium 10, Jungle Scout, and stuff like that. I'm curious if you have any data from SellerSnap, if you're seeing a similar thing, and if so, what your thoughts are on the, the state of the industry currently. Yeah, it's a good good question. I, I saw that same post from Scott, actually. I didn't notice it. Um, I, don't, I don't necessarily know that I could call um, a decline in people searching um, or reaching out to try our specific platform. Um, we are definitely seeing um, an increase in attrition or people leaving the service specifically for leaving the Amazon space. You know, a lot of people reaching out and canceling their accounts when we ask why they go um, or we're closing down our Amazon business. And we track that information and it's, that's definitely increased. Um, so there's that. And we, we saw a lot of Section 3 violations in the last few months. What is uh, Section 3? What is Section 3? Section Section 3 violation. Um, uh, it's having just having your, it's actually a very ambiguous statement for having your Amazon accounts terminated. Um so people were having their Amazon accounts closed down because they couldn't prove their supply chains. We saw that a lot. And so then they just have their account blocks. And um, so we saw that a lot. So I think Amazon, you know, they're tightening, tightening um, their supply chains with third-party sellers, people that maybe can't verify where they bought their products from. And they're, um, they're closing down the margins. So maybe it's not as profitable as it used to be to have an Amazon business. And so we're seeing some, some decreases there for sure. But I think people are eager as ever to, you know, build, become entrepreneurs and uh, build autonomy and, you know, work from anywhere. So I think as long as that exists, people are going to be interested in the space. And we're definitely seeing a lot of new young um, sellers, you know, uh, like seller bros, <laughs> these, you know, young kids that are getting into this high school or early university and they're side hustling. And um, I think there's a changing of the guard there as well. So positive things. Yeah, yeah, Amazon's definitely maturing and things are getting harder. But I think that also means that the people who stick it out and ride it out through this turbulent period and come out on the other side successful are going to have that much less competition and that much more opportunity. So sure, it's always the way. For sure. But yeah, the changing of the guard thing is interesting. You're you're absolutely right because it I've been selling on Amazon for a decade now, which is crazy to even think about. So there's people that are potentially starting to sell on Amazon that might have been like, you know, 4, 5, 6 years old when I started selling on Amazon. And so you've got this new batch of people that are coming in and there's a lot more tools out there now, right? We were, we're talking about Jungle Scout and Helium 10, but there's a lot of other tools that have come on the market uh, that people could be using as well. So that could be a part of it also. Yeah, definitely, definitely. There is, there's, you know, always new things and um, always new ideas and new tools. And um, I think that we'll just go through cycles. People will come and they'll go. And like you said, people will mature through um, the waves and others will, will churn out. And um, whether it's technology or businesses, you know, there's, there's always movement. And I guess that's a good thing as well. Um, but it's, yeah, it's an it's a awesome space to be in from that perspective because there's something always new to, to, to push you. Yep, for sure. All right, Adrian, any, any last things that you want to discuss before we wrap it up here? No, that's not about it, Todd. I really appreciate you having me on the podcast and um, it was a, a really enjoyable chat. So I hope I get to do it again. And, um, you know, I hope we, we stay in touch between that next session and, and this one. Yeah, absolutely. And how can people reach out to you and connect with you guys if they want to? So we, uh, you can find us at sellersnap.io or just search sellersnap in, in Google. And, you know, we're on all the social media platforms and Twitter and um Instagram and everything else or X and everything else. So, so search for us and um, recommend, you know, jumping online if you're interested in um, doing a 15 day free trial and our customer success team will really hold your hand through that experience and get you up and running. Um, we you know we're very hands on with that type of stuff. So hope to see you in the digital realm, everyone. And um, yeah, thanks. Thanks again for having me, Tom. Absolutely. This has been Nick. Great, Adrian. You have an awesome day. You too. This has been another episode of the Amazon Seller School Podcast. Thanks for listening, fellow Amazon seller. And always remember, success is yours if you take it.